Grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. How good it is to, to gather together in this place to worship our God. Now, a couple of announcements, and I really ask your patience for this, um, although some of you, I'm sure all of you want to stand up and cheer. No doubt you have heard that the Centers for Disease Control has said that if people, anyone who is fully vaccinated can go without these. So you can take your masks off if that's you. Oh, did you hear that collective sigh? <laughs> now, I, am, I would ask you to understand that so much of this regulation is in the control of other people. I, we did get, I did receive an email from the district superintendent sending us the information from the Centers for Disease Control. But we know the numbers all over the world, including the country, have been up and down and up and down. Um, I would ask you to, we're going to keep the, the barriers up to keep the spacing in the pews because I think that's a fair compromise. Number one, not everybody is fully vaccinated. Some people aren't comfortable going without those precautions. So, you know, be, be kind of careful about running up and hugging everybody today. <laughs> uh, unless it's somebody that you already know you can do that with. So if we continue to respect each other's boundaries um, and, and the need for space, there's no reason we can't gather indoors without our masks. And we can sing without our masks. But I think... For the time being, keeping those, the extra spacing, and maybe sticking with the number of verses that we're doing, let's just ease into this. Um, because we don't know, you know, what the future will bring. And I don't want us to be a total letdown if we have to go back to masks. I, I think it seems like we're going to be okay, at least for now. But I mean, just not even about regulations, but just in terms of what the virus is doing all around the world. So, hallelujah. <laughs> um, another thing is uh, you might have just sort of noticed it coming in but there's a bulletin board on the inside of that back pew and it is filled with individual thank you notes from the Leroy 4-H youth um, it, the bulletin board was put together by Matthew and Caitlin um, I did say Leroy right um, so I hope you'll take time to read their notes because we've offered them space. We do our best to support them a little bit financially and they're really appreciative. And uh, just the fact that they've taken the time to write those notes and it's there, please take the time to read them on your way out. Uh, Any time except in the middle of the sermon, I might be... <laughs> oh, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I just, I, it's so neat to have that there and I want to, to do that. Um, Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and I don't know what the weather will bring, but I will tell you, I was going to schlep it into church, but I decided it's too heavy to schlep around. My lawn chair is in the car, and it's going inside the parsonage door so that um, I can start taking advantage of opportunities to say, come on, bring your lawn chair, let's sit out front, let's sit and talk. Next Sunday, if the weather is good, and if you're interested, come to church early, I will do my best to be here and set up by about quarter after nine outside if the weather's good. And if the weather's not good, we've got a choice of downstairs in the parsonage, which gives us plenty of room to spread out. Or we could congregate in that back, that back room, that conference room. Bring, some, bring your own coffee. But I have asked Lily in anticipation of going mask-free to dust off the coffee maker so we can start coming in and helping ourselves to coffee. But next week, if you're going to come and join me the hour before worship, bring your own coffee, and anybody that's interested can bring some snacks to share, um, you know, a couple of cookies or whatever, um, as long as if you make something, know that you might end up taking most of it home. But um, I'll bring something. I, don't, I haven't decided what. Blueberry muffins or something. And let's... Let's have a party. Let's celebrate, not the masks. <laughs> Let's celebrate the Holy Spirit. Let's celebrate Pentecost. I just really want to have a party for Sunday, and this is the best way I can figure out to do it. Also, please wear red if you can, because it's you know, or f flame colors. So yellow, orange, red, all that's really good. Uh, but it's a tradition. So any other announcements? Again, if you're interested in purchasing blueberries from the 
Westfield hub, I think it is, or the Northern Tier Mission hub. Mm -hmm. um, there is a sign-up sheet in, on the back table here next to Tim. Please feel free if you have any questions to see me after church. They're $30 for a 10-pound box. Okay. And trust me, <laughs> they are really, really good. I've heard that. It, it's about all I can do to get through a one pound. <laughs> they scream. Fantastic. We eat them all winter long. Uh-huh. Very cool. So $30 for a 10 pounds of really good blueberries is a good price. All right. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right. Then let us enter into a spirit of worship. We've already begun to worship as we've, as we've sung songs, as we've, as we've gathered, as we've greeted each other, as we've let out our collective sighs of relief. Um, let's continue to worship as we sing, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated, and you will renew the face of the earth. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We come to a time of uh, sharing our joys and concerns and God sightings. Thank you. I have a I had a blessing this weekend. Jeremy and Rebecca and Ren and the twins were at Kirk's and I got to spend part of a day with them. And I, I loved it. The twins are two, Ren is four now, and they are active. <laughs> <laughs> Along with three dogs that play like crazy. <laughs> wow. Wonderful. Oh, yes. I was going to ask. Would you like me to... Mention this? Yes, please. All right. Pastor Michelle just handed me a certificate we received from the conference and a letter included um, from Bishop Park. I'll, I'll just read part of the letter to you. God's Spirit is alive and moving mightily in the churches of the Susquehanna Conference. It is with profound thankfulness and gratitude that I write this letter to your congregation. Because of your faithfulness and your generos generosity, you have paid 100% of your shares of ministry. Please know how proud I am of you and your congregation. 
Your commitment, your hard work, and your faithful spirit has allowed the Susquehanna Conference to honor our ministry commitment to missionaries across the world. Even during this pandemic, because of your generosity, your congregation made sure that our retired pastors and their spouses are cared for by supplementing their health insurance. You have helped seminary students and churches whose pastor has had medication and other emergencies. Churches and persons whose names you may never know have found life, new life, and a future full of hope because of your generosity. And you have helped spread the love of God and have brought Jesus to people who may not otherwise know him as Lord and Savior. He goes on with a few other things, but we have the certificate here, and um, I'll make sure that you get that, Pastor Michelle. Uh, or we can put it on the bulletin board out there so everybody can see it. Give yourselves a hand, church. That is four years ago that was impossible. Four years ago that was impossible, and probably even the year before that. Um, it's your generosity and your faithfulness and your sense of stewardship uh, that, has, that has made that possible. So thank you, Ruth. Any others, joys, concerns? I have a joy. I don't know how many have you noticed, but the lilac tree on the northeast corner of the church property is in full bloom, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I walked up to take a picture and got like just a little ways up and my eyes started watering and lilacs don't like me or I don't like them because they, I've got allergies, but it's absolutely gorgeous. So when you're driving by or when you're leaving the church, look up and see how pretty it is. I can be pretty focused. <laughs> so it's a good thing I didn't bring lilacs from home for church this morning. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do have one other announcement, and it's not, not anything bad, but if I could have just uh, two minutes conversation with Pastor Parrish after worship. Nobody's leaving. I just need to talk to you about something that's come up in our house. So um, thank you. I'll remind you, but all right. Let's have our prayer song and go to the Lord in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for all the blessings that you shower upon us. We thank you, Lord, for making us your children, for giving us the gift of life and the gift of your Holy Spirit, for, for making us church and family and for all the blessings of family and friends and home and shelter and all the things that we so easily take for granted. The beauty of the world around us, the birds that sing, the roosters that make a racket. I love them, Lord. I love hearing them. Lord, we pray for Carol's nephews, for Bill and for Kelly, that you will be with them and strengthen them. We pray for Judy Engler, Lord, for the DeFelice ladies in their new, in their new setting, in their new home. And we ask you to guide us and guard us as a church. Help us to... Be faithful in seeking your presence and, and hearing your voice. We pray for our youth and our, our families with, with teens and young people. And we pray for our extended church family and all those who are homebound and all those who are not able to be here. We ask you, Lord, to guide us. And we praise you, O oh Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I forgot to ask if anybody's in the parking lot. I don't, I don't think so, but I don't know. So if you are, the only way I'll know at this point is if you honk your horn. Not hearing anybody. All right. <laughs> 
I'm going to try to turn the volume down on this, but I may not succeed. So, oh. You know, I'll just put this over here. Um, we come to the messy church moment, and this morning, I really need your help with this. Um, I'm going to have to call Don and Henry because I asked them if they would still love me if I didn't hand anything out today. And now they knew there wasn't going to be a handout and they're not here. So I think I need to check. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I, I need your help. Uh, I think two weeks ago I said it was the match game, but it was really Family Feud. So I thought we'd play a church version of Family Feud. And here's the question. Name something that grows or needs to grow. Name something that grows. Grass. Grass. <laughs> okay. Trees. Trees. Flowers. Flowers. Okay. What else? Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Okay. What else needs to grow? Our faith. Our, who said? Somebody said our faith. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Name something that needs to grow. Yeah, love, yeah. I might, one of my favorite, favorite quotes from a really famous theologian named Oscar Hammerstein II from the musical, um, yeah, <laughs> The Sound of Music. Love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. And parents especially, but not only parents, but you know when you're waiting for that second child to come and you were so thoroughly in love with the first child and you're not sure there's enough love in your heart for the second and then the, sec the next one comes and then maybe the next one comes and, and you realize that love just multiplies. Love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Love has to grow. Where does that growing love come from? I believe that it comes from God. That you know that God's love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We cannot love sufficiently on our own, no matter how much our human love isn't gonna isn't gonna make it. So things that need to grow. So let's stick with flowers, for instance. What do flowers need to grow? I'm a city girl, remember? You gotta tell me these things. Rain. Rain. Oh sunshine. sunshine. Fertilizer? What else? Say it again. Love? Okay. Yeah. Weeding. Oh, all of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. Well, what happens if these just stay in the packet? Nothing. They're not going to grow if I just leave them and ignore them? They've got to be all that other things? How are we, as Christians, like the seeds? What do we need to grow? God's love. God's love. Mm -hmm. What else? What do we need to grow as Christians? More prayer time. We cannot pray enough. Hmm? Word of God. We need each other. The, the, the churchy word for this is fellowship. There could be some not as churchy words, but we need the companionship of other Christians on the journey with us. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have friends who aren't Christian or aren't our kind of Christian or don't have any faith at all because how are all those other people going to have a clue about God's love unless they get it from us because somehow we are in each other's circle, right? We are connected, so we are the best chance for the people in our circles and our communities and our organizations and our families to know and experience God's love through us. I have a really close friend. She's former sister-in-law. And whenever there's a major health issue, she writes to me and says, please pray. She really relies on the fact. Now, she herself is not as sure about a relationship with God, 
But she knows that God answers prayers, and she knows that there's someone or some people that she can reach out and say, please pray because my brother has cancer, my best friend was injured in a fire, whatever it is. And sometimes I don't hear from her for months on end, but it is, it is almost always a request for prayer. So, you know, we need... So what does weeding look like for us? Maybe repentance? Ooh! <laughs> we don't like to think we might need some weeding, but, but we do because we backslide. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but we need those things. We need the nurture of Scripture and the sacraments and each other and prayer and service. We need service. We need to be in service. And I think that's something that most of us sort of miss. And, and because, I'm going to step out and say, maybe we're afraid or embarrassed. So often what happens in churches is the best way we serve administratively. And churches need administration. But, and administration is a spiritual gift. But it's the one we're comfortable with. Thank you very much. But what God invites us to do, needs us to do, is so much more than that. So anyhow, that's a messy church moment. Um, I do not have a really good reputation for growing things. And when I asked Roger if I could bring this into church and bring it home, he said, you might as well, you've already killed them, you picked it up. (laughs) Seriously, when we were in Bald Eagle, we planted irises. And he's smart, you know, like you. He's from the country, you know. I handed him every one of those iris bulbs, and I guarantee you he was too smart to plant them upside down. Not one itty-bitty green leaf out of all those bulbs ever, ever. Yeah, that cemented my reputation as a plant killer. (laughs) Okay, so moving on from the messy church moment. Um... And thank you for helping me understand this. I appreciate that. Because I really am a city girl. Oh, I'm really a beach girl, but, you know. Okay, two scripture readings for today. Um, the first one is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 to 11. How do you like that name there? Theophilus. It means lover of God. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering... He presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God add God's blessing to the reading and hearing of this word. And then the gospel of Jesus Christ from John's gospel, 
chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now hear me, these are dangerous words. Then we'll talk about why. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Everybody there that wants to be? Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be, anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have an eternal life indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, holy God, be present with us as we listen, as we wrestle and reflect. Lead us, O oh God, and guide us. For it is in your Son's name that we make this prayer. Amen. So um, we're kind of in the middle of the series on the Holy Spirit. We started a couple weeks ago on on the first Sunday in May. Um, And I shared with you part of my rationale in wanting to do this series is twofold. And part of it was just very practical. I have a really good friend who wanted to do a Bible study about the Holy Spirit and um, her pastor doesn't really teach. And so, you know, after a little conversation, we decided that since I'm not in town and she's not United Methodist and we're friends, we could do this one-on-one on the phone. And, and it's been a lot, for me, it's been a lot of fun because I just want to, I love to teach. You know, drop a hat and yeah, I'm there. So it, it's been a lot of fun. She was really worried about, you know, is this is extra work for you. And I said, I'll do a sermon series, and that way it'll be double work and it'll be okay. But also, part of my motivation, besides my uh, conversations with my friend Carol, is that next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. It's a day that we celebrate in the church. Um, We celebrate the birth of the church or the birthday of the church or the um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we celebrate it without a whole lot of forethought. It's kind of like, okay, this is another day in the church. Happy birthday, church. What's next? And I thought maybe we might celebrate it a lot better if we spent some time talking about who is the Holy Spirit and and why does it matter for us to know about who the Holy Spirit is. 
So, you know, that was kind of like the first week talking about preparing to get ready to celebrate, not just to have a party, but to really celebrate this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit that has been poured out on us. You see, there's a place where our English language um, lets us down. Because without a regional understanding of you plural, when we read the word you, we don't know if it's singular or plural. Um, unless, unless you're in the Pittsburgh area and you know it's Yunes, I still can't pronounce that right. Or if you're in the South and you know y'all, it's more than one, it's plural. But us, we don't really have anything to distinguish that. And in the, in the, the scriptures, whether it's Jesus talking or somebody else, they tend to flip-flop between talking to you, talking to you. Uh, and that happens in the context of the story, too. So anyway... Um, one of the first things that I, I shared that first week is the Holy Spirit is a who, not a what. Because um, we don't necessarily talk about the Holy Spirit very often. It's not always a comfortable conversation. Because the Holy Spirit's kind of that woo-woo <laughs> part of God that we aren't necessarily comfortable with. Uh, so it's important to say that the Spirit is a who, not a what. But also how. How the Holy Spirit works not only in biblical history, in the scriptures, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives is really important. And it's something, especially the action of the Holy Spirit in us, is something that we tend to recognize more after the experience than in the present moment. Except there are those present moments when, you know, we've talked about in that moment of knowing we're being prayed for, in that moment of crisis, knowing that there's comfort right there, But most generally, it's when we kind of look back, that Monday morning quarterbacking thing, and say, God was with me. That's how I got through that. So how we experience God. Um, One thing I didn't share with you last week. Last week, the major scripture was the story of Peter and Cornelius and how he was sent to Cornelius, who was not uh, Jewish. And as he was sharing with Cornelius and his family the story of Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And, and some of the commentaries say the people, Cornelius and her, not just his family, but his household, were immersed in the Holy Spirit. Um, just such a wonderful image. Um, and one of the things I shared with you last week is one important reason for us to understand more about the Holy Spirit is the spiritual gift of discernment. Um, can be, should be very crucial in our lives as individuals um, and our lives as a congregation as we attempt to seek God's guidance for our present, for our future, for our actions, for our behavior. Um, How exciting to know that um, when we have a moment of conscious conscience that it's the Holy Spirit so much better than Jiminy Cricket. You know, or the good angel and the bad angel, the, the characters of the cartoons, you know, image that the Spirit of God that dwells in us will guide us and remind us of, of who we are and who we, who we are meant to be. Last week, we attempted to show you a scene from the movie Finding Dory, and while the scene didn't work, I kind of walked you through the, the parts of it, of how, and my connection with that is the Holy Spirit beckons us towards God. Um, just, you know, come on, come on. Come and, come and pray. Come and serve. Pick up the phone and call this person. Uh, stop what you're doing and pray. There's all kinds of ways that the Holy Spirit attempts to speak to us. And, and again, with, it, with all the things we talked about, the things that are essential for our growth as Christians are, are, um, are true of that. In order for us to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit and the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's really important for us, I believe, to be in regular prayer, regular scripture reading, regular fellowship, regular presence in worship, um, receiving communion as often as we possibly can, and using the gifts, the gifts that God has given us to serve. Often, um, I haven't done this for a while, but often if if I write to you or I comment to you about your service, I, I'll use the phrase, you know, about the ways you serve Christ through the church. You're not serving the church. You might think you are serving the church, but you are serving Christ through 
your service in the church. So all of that is just really, really important. And um, my friend Carol, <laughs> my friend Carol, after about the third week, she said to me, okay, Pastor Michelle, I think I got what I wanted. And I said, but there's so much more. <laughs> There is so much more because it's, um, I think, it's impossible to talk about the Holy Spirit without talking about the Trinity. It's impossible to talk about the Holy Spirit without talking about grace. Grace is, we said the first week, John Wesley defined grace as God's love. And, and my, one of my favorite scriptures that you should be used to by now, God's love poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit is the verse that Wesley keyed into Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Um, grace is God's love, but there's also another important definition of grace, which is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. We don't deserve God's love and God's presence in our lives, but we get it because God's love for us is so passionate. God's desire to be with us is so beyond our ability to imagine. Think about how much you love the person or people that you love most in your life. God's love is so much bigger than that. His passion for you, his love for you is so much greater than that. Or he wouldn't have sent Jesus. And, he would, and Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. Acts, the first reading from Acts chapter 1, and Jesus is leaving at the beginning of the story of the, you know, the, the birth of the church and the, the movement of Christianity, and Jesus is leaving because he knew he was leaving us in good hands. He, he knew that only if he returned to the Father could they, would they send the Holy Spirit. And, and the key word is outpouring of the Holy Spirit, outpouring. So leaving the disciples in that first chapter so that the Spirit could be free, unleashed, and outpoured on the disciples, but on us. It's so important for us to realize that you plural. Why? Because we need to understand that it includes us, you and me, are part of that people that received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Spirit is not limited in us. So um, I wanted to talk today about grace and new birth because those are two things that are part of the so much more about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit operates in our lives. That when we accept Christ, we're saved, right? There's, there's a couple of old you should pardon the expression, old and evangelical terms that probably most people don't use. I don't know when's the last time you've talked to somebody about being justified. Uh, maybe if you were sharing the message of the gospel, you did, but justification is not a common word that most people are familiar with. And those of us who had typing classes on typewriters, we understood what it meant to be justified because we had to struggle to justify our margins. And that's the only way I can remember what that word means, being, you know, making sure that everything is right. We're made right. We're justified when we accept Christ. But something else happens that is a little different. When we are justified, when we are saved, when we've asked Jesus to come into our hearts, Jesus gives us new birth. Jesus gives us new birth. Now, I think if I can remember to come back here, I, I need to shift gears for a minute because I need to tell you why I said that re story about Nicodemus was dangerous. And I won't even ask you to guess why I'm going to tell you. This is why I think the story about Nicodemus is dangerous. Because it is so familiar. Because it is so familiar, we figure we know what it's all about and we kind of shut down. And I think that is to our detriment. Um, one thing, um, when we read that Nicodemus went to see Jesus by night, we're often told, and I was surprised it wasn't in the text. I am so used to hearing people say and reading, Jesus went to see, Nicodemus went to see Jesus by night because for fear of the Jews. 
That's not in the text. It might be in other places, but it doesn't say that. So I'm thinking, and I, I sort of saw this somewhere, but I really got to think, why else would Nicodemus go to see Jesus at night if it wasn't out of fear? Because most really smart people, you know, no lights, no street lights, very dangerous, would not go around at night if they didn't have to. So why would Nicodemus go to see Jesus at night? And here's why I think. He very well may have been afraid of, the, of his brothers, Pharisees, and maybe didn't want them to know. But you've read how busy Jesus is all day long. When else are you going to have a one-on-one, -on -one, in-depth, personal conversation with Jesus about the things of God? Except maybe when everybody else is afraid to go out and you can have Jesus' undivided attention. It's worth thinking about. And it's worth thinking about it because it puts a different, slightly different spin on the story. Another really dangerous part of the story to me is John 3.16. Now you can say, oh, Pastor Michelle, how can you say that's dangerous? That's the gospel in a nutshell. It's on, it's on sheets and posters and banners at every national sports game. And how can you say that? What kind of Christian are you? It's dangerous because it's only half the thought. Because John 3.16 it's followed by 17. Why don't we teach people to learn them together? Because it's those two statements together that summarize the gospel, not just John 3.16. We really need to, you know, they, they, they need to get married. In, in our practice, John 3.16 needs to marry John 3.17 and stay together, and then we will have a much fuller witness um, and more to think about. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, this business of being born again. Um, I use the New Revised Standard Version. The translation says born from above. I'm not sure what the NIV says. Anybody have one? What does yours say? Yeah, it's... Um, oh. You must be born from above. Verse 8. Or before that. Yeah, verse 3, I think. You must be born again. Okay. Okay, all right. Carol, and you have the New King James Version, right? Is that open? Do you have it open? I think chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, so here's my, here's, this might not be a problem for anyone, but I want to share this thought with you. First of all, the Greek word, it can mean either. The, the, because this text was written in Greek. So the word that's in there in Greek can either mean be born from above or born from again. First century. But for us, that phrase being born again carries a lot of baggage. Because, you know, some of you may have had experience with Christians who say they're born again and they've been in your face and just a really, really bad experience. So because it comes with so much baggage, it can be hard for us to hear that you must be born again, and what do I do with this? So I have a suggestion. I don't want you to get rid of it. It's, it's a fair translation. But because of the baggage associated with it, because it's hard for us to really understand, I want to suggest that we treat that like a butterfly. Everybody likes butterflies, right? They're pretty. All kinds of butterflies. This is, if you... Take your hands like this in front of your face. I want you all to help me with this, okay? So now, cross your hands and interlock your thumbs. This is uh, American Sign Language for Butterfly. I want you to get an imaginary butterfly net <laughs> and take that butterfly and escort it outside <laughs> because for right now, it doesn't belong in here um, so that we can think a little more clearly about what it means to be born from above what it means to be born from water and the spirit. Now, I don't want you to kill the butterfly or anything else. Just, just sort of set it aside because it's hard 
If that's in your mind, if that's a thing that's in your mind, especially if you're someone that has a negative experience, or you're so set with, okay, this is what it meant in 1980, that it's hard for you to think about, but what, was, what did Jesus mean in the year 30 or 27, or whenever Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus, and that's where we need to go. Well, what did Jesus mean when he said this to Nicodemus? Now, sometimes what we might do with this is say, Nicodemus, that's just so silly. How could possibly you be, you know, somebody go back into the womb once they're an adult? But you know what? When I was about six years old, I thought people were born fully grown. I just now I was six, and Nicodemus was a much older man. But the thing is, in the Gospels especially, um, and a little bit in Paul's writing, but in the Gospels, whenever somebody has a misunderstanding that's so blatant like that, you know what happens? Jesus gets to teach. Jesus gets to meet them where they are and say, now look at this. And, and, and that's a feature that happens in John's Gospel a lot. And so rather than, you know, wasting our, our mental and spiritual energy on saying, oh, Nicodemus, what a dummy, we should have our ears open and say, what's coming next? What's coming next? And so Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born from above by the Spirit. The, wind, the word for when Jesus talks about you hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from, in Hebrew, and I think maybe in Greek too, The word wind is the same for the wind for spirit and the same for the word for breath. Jesus is talking about being born from the spirit, that that new birth that that is going to be coming, that we've received, that new birth. And um, what do you want to say about that? When Jesus talks about water in the Spirit, because we're, you know, centuries and centuries later, and we're Christians and we've been baptized, we naturally think of baptism, and and that's a really that's a really good connection because Jesus was not yet talking about the Holy Spirit. The disciples had not yet received the Holy Spirit; they were just beginning to sort of learn, Um, just like in last week's reading when. um, Peter asked Cornelius, you know, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, that's another group. But they say, did you receive the Spirit when you were baptized? And the answer was, we hadn't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. Well, this was news to the disciples, too, in this time. But Jesus is telling Nicodemus and and everybody that was listening, this is what you need. You must be born from water and the Spirit. We are humans, flesh and blood, but we are also spiritual people. And, and one really important reason, I think, for understanding more about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is how God relates to us, how God works in us. And so we need to um, have an understanding about that. Um, so that new birth that we receive, the, the gift of a new start spiritually, but that makes us spiritual infants with a lot of growing to do, a lot of learning to do. You know, we might say um, when a child is born, you know, you're going too fast, stop, slow down. I love the, I still love the old Carter's commercial, if only they could stay little until their Carter's wore out. Uh, but then there's a point where we're kind of like, grow, 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 come on, hurry up. This is hard, keep growing. God wants us to grow, just as we want our children to grow. And, you know, I really wish that the church in general had come up with this before the United States Army, because I am sure that God wants, all us, wants us to be all that we can be. And because God wants us to be all that we can be, God gives us the Holy Spirit. But guess what? Even having the Holy Spirit, we're not marionettes. We're not forced God, God's grace is given to us but so we can cooperate with that grace. It's like a kid that won't eat is not getting nutrition. God isn't going to force us into anything. God isn't going to drag us by the hair and say, you, with me, now this is not the army. Um, God is going to give us the grace that we need and the gifts that we need. But... 
there's a wonderful quote from Augustine, St. Augustine, that says, God who made us without ourselves will not save us without ourselves. And what that means is that God gives us the grace, but we've got to cooperate with it. Um, I know I've got to stop soon. Grab your hymnals and open them to page 34 for me. Page 34 in your hymnals. Oh, oh okay. Anybody not have a hymnal? Oh, oh. After church, would you come down and grab a hymnal and take it back to where you sit? Page 34. Thank you, Loreen. Page 34. Right in the middle of this, this is under, you might think, why this page? This is, um, I'll wait. Page 34. It's, a, the, it's part of the baptismal service. And if you go down to the second paragraph, there's questions. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? This is part of our baptismal promises, and we say yes. Uh, But we don't read these very often unless someone else is being baptized or joining the church. But I think this is so key to our spiritual lives as Christians because God gives us the freedom, God gives us the power to resist temptation and all 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 those things, evil and injustice and oppression. But God doesn't force us. We have to cooperate with that. Um, And if you're anything like me, there's times and I I pray for this. I pray for the grace to resist evil, to resist sin. Sometimes I don't want to resist. Do you ever, I mean, you know, don't tell any tales out of school, but we're human and we don't always want to not do that thing we want to do because we want what we want. And then we'll repent. So, God does not force us into this, but to me, this promise and this reality is absolutely key in our spiritual lives. There's so much more, but I'll stop. I hope somehow this is helpful. Um, I hope, to me, this is so important for us to have an understanding of how God, who gives us the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit will help us to grow and help us to witness and help us to serve and help us grow beyond ourselves because that same Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters of creation and the waters teem with life, that same Holy Spirit that was part of raising Jesus from the dead is that same Holy Spirit that has been given to us. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelmingly important. So here's what I want to invite you to do this week um, as we prepare to celebrate not just the birthday of the church, because that's cool. We can have a birthday party for the church. It's, It's like celebrating a historic event. But I think much more important is to celebrate the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in us, on us, and to say, use me, O God, to do your will. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. So so during this week, I won't invite you. Remember to pray for the people of India and other parts of the world that are struggling with COVID. Pray for peace in Israel. And also pray for that re-emergence of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life so that you might serve fully. We ask, we ask ourselves, we ask each other from time to time, you know, why don't we see God doing the kind of things we saw God doing 
in the, in the early days of the church. And maybe God would ask us, why don't I see you doing those things? You've been given the spirit. You've been given the gifts. So maybe this week our prayer could be, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come to a time to bless the offering. Um, I think we'll still leave that instead of passing it. Let's, let's ease into normalcy very gradually. So we'll just still leave the offering plate back there because God doesn't need us to touch it to bless it. So let us be in a spirit of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we're so thankful for all the blessings that you shower upon us. Receive these offerings from the hands of your children, your servants, and multiply them for your use and service to your kingdom. Bless our offerings in the, in the baby bottles and our offerings in the plate, our offerings of service, and our offerings of ourselves to you and to one another for the good and glory of your, of your kingdom. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is How Great Thou Art, verses 1 and 4. <laughs> Don't you know that you are God's beloved child? That he smiles at the sound of your voice, that, that he loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus to you and then gave you the Holy Spirit and calls you into a family this cool? I mean, really. <laughs> Wherever you find yourself this day and this week, may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day. And remain with you always. Amen. Next week, bring a lawn chair and some goodies to share if you want. Come early, about quarter after nine. And we'll have a conversation and celebrate. And if Pastor Parish folks would come down, meet me down front for just a minute. I'd appreciate it. Thank you.